Hey everybody, just getting this stream up and running. Uh, thanks for your patience for tuning in now. I'm just checking up the technology. It's a moment of solidarity for all the frontline workers. So um, we have all them in mind right this minute. And I hope you're all joining in on that. It's going all around the world at the moment. So um, thanks for your patience for tuning in. And uh, yeah, we're hopefully going to be live any second now. Um, hopefully the stream is up and running. Um, I'm going to start off just with some solidarity for the frontline workers, everybody. Um, just want to double check we're live. We live. So thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Um, going to take me a little minute just to, to gather myself. And um, yeah. Solidarity with the frontline workers and people that are out there in the hospitals, in health centers, doctors, medics, paramedics, everybody involved in every way. There's so many people on the front line and even behind the scenes that we may never hear about. And uh, obviously it's a big moment of clapping for them. Um, but we also need to fight for them as well to make sure they have the protective equipment and the rights and wages that they deserve, not just today, but I think every day in general. Um, are, are these people, our medics, our friends, our family, the people that are midwives that help us when we're born, that help us when we're dying. Um, I think this time, this moment that we're in is showing us what really matters and who really matters. And um, it's a great moment to row behind them. And uh, just thanks so much for tuning in. I know um, you've all got a lot going on and it's a very challenging time for lots of people. Um, some of you may have children to put to bed or have already put them to bed and um, hopefully they're all snuggled in or maybe there's some kids watching uh, so I'd like to hear who is going to tune in and uh, very welcome to comment and um, I'd love to hear where you are um, love to hear what country what county um, who are you how did you end up on the stream uh, do you know about the book have you read the book already it's been posted out so those of you that just have ended up on the stream by pure accident, which is totally possible, uh, it's the Hitching for Hope book launch. Hitching for Hope is my new book. Uh, it's Hitching for Hope, a journey into the heart and soul of Ireland. Um, but it's also community gathering because we're in a very particular time at the moment, a turbulent time, a difficult, challenging time, an upsetting time as well. And um, it's, I want to turn it into something that's more about, less about me and more about we. Uh, it's about the collective. and. Ultimately, that's what my work has always been about. And that's what the book is about. It's about community and the power of community and the power of coming together. And that's not to deny the power of the individual in following individual's path, the individual's dreams. So there's a lot of that in the book as well about finding our unique roles in the whole thing. And um, I want to say also that um, obviously, this was meant to be a tour. I was meant, to, I don't, where was I meant to be tonight? Eason's in Dublin. Um, and a big thanks to Eason's who are streaming this and co hosting it and have put the book on special offer, just 11.24 with postage, fair play. Um, so I want to support Eason's and also support all booksellers, independent booksellers. Um, that a lot of small businesses, in particular, going through a tough time, all business going through a tough time. So um, support um, our Irish businesses where you can, whether it be online sales or when we come out the other side of all this. Um, but yeah, that was, I was meant to be in the Auris with Michael D yesterday, presenting with the book. There's the book. Looks good, feels good. And um, I can talk to you maybe a little bit if you want to know about, about the cover, uh, the design or, or anything really, the blurbs. Um, maybe we'll do a little, questions and answers later on. Uh, if, if anyone's interested, you might all run off to go to bed or maybe we've nowhere to go anymore, do we? We're not allowed to go anywhere. Um, but please do stay tuned. We've got some special guests and um, amazing um, campaigners, um, Lynn Rowan, Francis Black, not more than campaigners, um, senators, um, and just really incredible human beings. And we have another incredible human being in Colin McInumra. I don't know if he is a human being. He might be kind of, he's kind of transcendental. So uh, he definitely is of human form, but he's pretty mystical and magical. And so is his music, as you'll hear. Um, 
so yeah, it was meant to be Eason, the RS yesterday, Eason's today, and then I was going to hitchhike to seven other launches, and I had them all organized in different bookshops and venues around the country. Donegal, Cavan, Coot Hill, uh, Gawas, Galway, Limerick, Cork, Lynch. Anyway, so uh, this corona crap hit us, and we've all had to learn, adapt, dance, adjust, and make do. And yeah, I mean, I had a, a little moment of disappointment, but really none of that matters right now. The things that matter right now are our health, our, our families, our food, our shelter, and, uh, you know, books, entertainment, all of those, like art is important, knowledge is important, voice is important, but uh, the most important thing is that we're all safe and well, and um, I think we're rowing together in that regard really well, and I'm inspired, you know, it's, as I said, like it's an upsetting time of upheaval, but it's, I can see a lot of beauty coming through the cracks, and uh, that inspires me. I see that all the time, but particularly now there seems like a flourishing and the reason I'm excited about that is I think that we need that always not just in a crisis because we have been in many forms of crisis before this one uh, ecological healthcare housing uh, carers teachers parents under serious pressure and under resourced and we need um, a coming together regardless and I think I'd like to think that the book is about that as well um, and also a bit of crack and um, bit of crack and observing the beauty of Ireland and the beauty of our people. And um, yeah, I want to also say um, I'm excited about having been able to have this experience with you. I want to say that I had to figure out the technology bit today. I don't really, I'm a big fan of technology, but I didn't know how to use it, to be honest. Uh, I didn't know how to do all the streaming stuff. So I can't guarantee you it's all going to go to plan. So please be gentle and patient with me if things get a little bit bumpy and messy. Um, we'll figure it out together. Hopefully, well, I'll figure it out. Um, I, I, I'm confident. Send me good juju, good wishes. Um, but I have some good news to share as well. And um, well, firstly, my brother, Sean Og, lives in China uh, with his wife, uh, Rosemary, and daughter, Roisin. And so as a family, uh, we've been following this situation for about three months now. And thankfully they're coming out the other end um, and the Sean Oak's back to work now. And they managed it very well. It was quite difficult. They had to live with, all come together as a family, the extended family were living with them. And they really rode in and Sean Oak um, really worked hard on his music. He started online courses and he's made a couple of amazing music videos for children uh, that I'll share on my Facebook page in the coming days. And he really used this time as a moment of creativity and expression. And I'd like to think that where, we, where we're missing out on certain things, maybe we'll be able to use this time together for other things as well. Uh, but it is good news that China, and we could say a lot about China and it, its government and its approach to life, but there has been um, an impressive response in so many ways that have allowed them to come out the other end. And I think we can come out the other end as well. And that's good news. And the other big news is that my baby sister, Sinead in Galway, we're originally from Cavan, those that don't know us. And um, my baby sister, Sinead, who is one of Ireland's most amazing, uh, brilliant yoga teachers. Um, she had a baby boy uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, and we're really excited about that. Um, we were a little bit, well, I was a little bit worried about everything that's going on and it would really make you additionally value our health services and our midwives and all the various supports and um, feel very grateful. So welcome to the world. I don't know if I'm allowed to announce the baby's name. Maybe I'll find out. Uh, it's, she's still kind of, things are a little bit private for now. But um, yeah, it's just great to celebrate new life. And this is the season of the spring equinox where light conquers darkness, come on the light. <laughs> um, and it's, that's kind of where Easter came from. Well, that's my trip on it anyway. I mean, obviously there's Christian tradition and many traditions, but it's really a celebration of rebirth and renewal and then um, spring and nature coming into to beauty. So I think that's a good energy to roll with. Um, 
So I'm going to um, check now to see, can I get this started? I don't know if people are commenting because I can't see all that because I'm, I'm a little bit redundant and basic, uh, but my wonderful, amazing wife is here behind me or in front of me, um, Susan Quirk, who is, well, she helps me keep all of this show on the road and help me get this book over the line and has been really just the most amazing gem in every way. And I can't thank her enough because it, was, it wasn't it was always easy uh, and it isn't always easy listening to me. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm especially um, grateful to Susan and to, to so many people, publishers, Chelsea Green, how is all? I hope you're tuned in. Um, publishers in Vermont, all the Vermont people, I hope you're there commenting. I don't know if you are. Um, Gil Hess, the publicist, Sarah Ingle, who helped with the copy edit, and so many proofreaders that, let me just show you this for a second. Uh, uh, oh, jeez. Look at all this. Uh, they're like manuscripts from like months and months ago that uh, several people, Ronan Carl, Marie Duffy, Jody Henderson, Neve Devereaux. Um, I'm going to miss people if I start naming loads of people, so please forgive me. You're all mostly, hopefully, named at the back of the book in the acknowledgement section. But there are so many people donated and supported me, my work, my podcast. And I just hopefully you take it for granted that you know I'm grateful. Um, I don't always get to express that or remember to express it. Um, but the book is a... This belongs to more people than me. It, the stories are not my stories. They belong to everybody that shared them. And I feel it's collective efforts. And really anything that happens in the world is collective efforts. So, and it's often the people behind the scenes are the, the unsung heroes. Um, so I'll, sh I'll try and uh, stop rambling now. Uh, you might be glad to hear. Um, and I'm gonna see, can I bring in my first special guest? Uh, who is Lynn Ruan. Um, I don't know if we have the tech all ready to go. I hope we do. Uh, Lynn, who most people will know, not everyone, maybe the Americans don't know, one of Ireland's foremost campaigners, an independent senator, um, best-selling author, Woo! Uh, people like us. Um, she's just a fantastic human being and uh, an inspiration to me. She, she I was like really grateful she read the book um, before it came out and gave me a blurb. And then Chelsea Green, the publisher, chose Lynn's blurb for the front cover. Um, I'll read it out to you if you want. Um, let me see. I'll read the longer version inside. She says, I ah, know I won't because it's blowing smoke up my own ass. Uh, uh, I, I'll let you read the book and figure it out for yourself. Um, but I'm not seeing Lynn coming into the frame here. So... I'm going to see, can I just beam her in another way? Because um, thank you for bearing with me, by the way. Um, I am just messaging her on the old WhatsApp machine here. I know this is like the most dull kind of watch to see somebody's doing this. By the way, um, this lad, uh, this lad came hitching with me all around Ireland. He, he hasn't a name, but if you have any suggestions, um, Lynn said she's trying to join now, and this is like the most dull type of stuff uh, for people to, to kind of observe. Um, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, that link work. So um, if you have any questions about the book um, or the writing of the book or what it's about or creativity or any of that kind of stuff, and we might do a little Q&A afterwards. Um, that's assuming we're still online. Um, so apparently, um, Lynn is not being allowed into the meeting and that's um, really unfortunate. Um, uh, it's saying I'm not letting her in. Jesus, I wish I had some technical support here, folks. Um, oh, I see her. Sorry, Lynn, she's gonna kill me now. Um, that's assuming we're still online. Um, you there? Oh, I nearly had a freak out there. Well, I was having a freak out. So, I'm after coming out of Facebook behind you there now. Yeah, so it's just me and you, and then I lose that other screen. Yeah. As long as you keep the two meter distance, you're grand. 
Say, Ben, he's at the book launch as well. Oh, how are you? <laughs> How's she cutting? <laughs> uh, oh, I just got a message telling me to, to call the teddy or call the, the teddy um, buddy after a dog. I keep getting messages of people, uh, photographs of dogs reading the book. I have no idea. It's a whole like, thing that's going on. Like, all, hopefully some humans are into it too. Look at you with your big glass of wine. I haven't had a drink in weeks, so this is, I'm celebrating you and, and your amazing book. So I'm using you as an excuse to have a glass of wine tonight. It's uh, not a real, it's not a real book lunch unless somebody's drinking wine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm on chamomile tea. <laughs> well, you can, you can stick to the chamomile and the daffodils yeah. are beautiful in the background there yeah. as well. Oh, I'm just going to do a, a double check with the master ceremonies behind me here, or the, the, the project director, Susan, and to make sure everything's flowing well on the stream. Susan. Susan. Got the earphones in. I think there might be a tiny little bit of a lag. Um, but I think I'm good. Uh, you just talk amongst yourselves there, Lynn, for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all good, all good, all good, all good. Okay, so Lynn, listen. Yeah. You're a legend. Um, you're welcome. Thank you for beaming in and thank you for reading the book. And I mean, I was actually got emotional um, when you texted me your comments about the book, not because they were lovely comments, but because you strike me as one of the busiest people in Ireland. <laughs> and you know, you went and read it. It takes, takes me a fucking long time to read any book, really. But you just really did it diligently and carefully. And I actually got really emotional that somebody would do that. And, and other people did it as well. Like, um, but I just, yeah, I, I'm really grateful. And then, like, I got amazing blurbs. I'm really fucking buzzed about on, these. Go on. You said you didn't want uh, to blow your own heart. Where did you hear who's in here, like... Um, like uh, Christy Moore, oh, sure, look, you have to mention Christy Moore. No, you um, Christy Moore, Amanda Palmer, Brian O'Connell, Chuck Collins, Andrew Forstroffel, uh, Alistair McIntosh, Peggy Seeger, Bill McKibben, Joanna Macy, Colin McCann, Caitlin Hogan. Anyway, loads of ledge bags all over the world, Americans, Canadians, all sorts. And then Mrs. Big Ledge Bag ends up on the front. And your one from Tala ends up on the front, huh? <laughs> Oh, Christy. Ah, <laughs> uh, Christy will forgive you. <laughs> right. So anyway, listen, I'm going to I'm going to kick back with me Teddy and me chamomile here and um like I don't know Lynn, like it, like we have to like speak to the moment here because first of all like our frontline workers, obviously we celebrate them, we honor them, but I also say we should fight for them. Um, and to, to have all the protective gear and the rights that they need. So I want to just name where we're at at this time in the moment and a time for stress for a lot of people. Um, in reading the book, Lynn, or anything you want to say about it, like yeah. what, what was your impression of it all? Um, I don't need you to kind of, you know, bask me in praise at this point. I'm grand. People can read the book. And no, I'll, I'll, chat a little bit. I'll chat a little bit about the book. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... If, for me, I think the first thing that, that I connected with was, and I've said it years ago as well, that I never, you know, when people talk about being, say, you know, you know, being Irish or being from Ireland or having some sort of identity that, that's a, that, that attaches you to the land in which you're from. Well, I only ever felt attached to the land which I could see and the environment which I, which I could see, which was which was Tala. And I never really connected with who I was as an Irish citizen, whether that be through history, whether that be understanding the political landscape for, you know, the last hundred years. I just didn't feel any connection to any of that. And I always said um, that listening to Michael D, actually, when he talks and like, with his understanding of, of Ireland and heritage and culture, that he was probably my first kind of hook into what it means to be Irish and um, beyond just their immediate environment. And I got that feeling again for the first time when I read your book and which I get from him, which was I felt connected to the country in, in, in which I live and um, 
I didn't explore Ireland much and I still don't, but it, it, again, your book gave me that want to know who, um, who I am beyond exactly the, the very location in which I'm from, you know? So hearing all the stories from all the different places around Ireland and the people and the characters and the culture and the humor, but also the truth and the realness and there was such a tread that, but like, I, I think we think we're all real different, like us from Dublin, or we, we're real different from, you know, anyone else that's not from like an like urban the, center. Down the country. From Everyone's down the country, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and reading your book, it really binds us all together in, in the things that we we all most desire as, as humans, which is um, connection and, and simplicity came up so much throughout the book. And when I was reading back over through the comments that the ones that I sent you, but also the handwritten ones that I made as I was reading, I got them down again today and um, just to read some of the words that I wrote to remind myself. And you would think you wrote that book right now when you're talking about simplicity and living off the land and a generation, like there's a line in it that talks about a world ending, like a, a whole generation of, 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 I wouldn't get the exact line up, but it was about how, like a whole generation collapsing and it does look completely different than the last one because of austerity. Like, and we're kind of in that again already. We're in that real move in, in how we respond to a crisis, like, you know, um, and the, the, the fact of how, how we need that simplicity now more than ever um, in terms of how we all relate to each other and support each other. And even just before, before I start watching, um, watching in tonight, just, watching the news of everyone clap around the whole of Ireland, you know, and your book connects us all in, in each county and in each home. And then just watching the news tonight, you can really feel that connection in us as, as people and as citizens. And I think what struck, struck me as well about the book is that you talk about so many different issues in such an accessible way. So you're just telling a story. You're just giving conversations, you know, it's, it's never preachy. It's never, you know, trying to teach someone or tell some, someone something about race or feminism or gender or poverty, or you're just literally giving voice uh, to other people's experiences. And then you're putting them in the book just in, in terms of the conversations you've had with them. And I think that's how most people um, relate is by hearing people's experiences rather than reading something academic or overly kind of structured about you know poverty or having to read a thesis on it you know I don't think people learn that way I think people learn through conversation and your book is about knowledge connection and learning through conversation you know and I think that's exactly what we need now never mind after the crisis is when is when you wrote it but like I mean it's it, it, it's as prevalent today um you know even more so maybe you know in in in, in how we all um in how you know when when shit hits the fan, um, we all we all have to come together to kind of walk as one and and walk as a as as a nation to kind of make sure that not only um do um those who have access to resources survive, but the most vulnerable. And I think looking at the the crisis in the last few weeks, I've seen so many people make sure that women in domestic violence situations, um, like tomorrow and tonight, an amendment passed on you know. Um, traveler accommodation and making sure that you know because public health is is um it's prison health it's traveler health it's women's health like public health is everyone's health and I think um if you were to sit down and read your book now it would help people kind of be able to formalize their thoughts and anxieties of what's happening now and help us to connect maybe a little bit earlier you know it took a long time for people to make sense of what happened in 2008 but now we're having to respond to something so big again so quickly that I think sitting down and reading your book in a time like this will, will show us how connecting to each other and supporting each other at the earliest possible point of a crisis like this shouldn't only be obviously crisis, but also should be prevention. But I mean, there was no preventing a public yeah. health issue, you know? Yeah. But it's mad to look at the, 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 the timing of this book coming out um, Oh man, like it's, real. it's a total head trip. Um, you know, I do you know about this whole thing about visualization? Mm. 
So, you saying you have you saying you manifested this public health crisis by writing this book? Oh man, I wouldn't put it past me. Um, <laughs> but I am. Um, I won't go into all my woe stories, but I really, really struggled to write a book. Um, my attention span can be a little bit troubled at times. Uh, <laughs> now, anyone who uses the internet might identify with that. Like, uh, I'll just write a book. I might go on Twitter. I, m- I might write, you know, there might be something new on Facebook to look at. Um, I'll just click on this thing. It always starts with this word, I'll just, and that's like the end of your day. But uh, trying to write a book, as you well know, is an exercise in fortitude and discipline and commitment. And that's what it really taught me. Um, but I used to go into Eason's. Actually, this it's only just come to me now. Um, I used to go into Eason's on O'Connell Street when I lived in Dublin and stare at the, the bestsellers. And it wasn't about a bestseller, but I used to just imagine my book on the shelf to help me like, get charged about getting it over the line. And, and then I ended up, Eason's uh, agreed to launch my book in O'Connell Street, and you were going to launch it. <laughs> and then now all the shops are closed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know what the moral of this story is, but it is, it's certainly it's hope. By- it's hope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I do know one message is please buy your books online if you can, uh, Eason's.com or wherever uh, you prefer to buy your books. And um, yeah, I like I don't, you know, I don't, as you well know, like you don't make a lot of money necessarily out of selling a book and author doesn't. So it's not about money. It's about the message. So I do want to get it out there. And I, 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 that's why I want people to buy books. It's not because I need you to buy my book for me. It's because I want that message out there and all those stories out there. So that's why I'm encouraging people to buy it. Um, but anyway, enough about that. Um, what was I going to ask you? Um, yeah, can I just ask you one thing? I wrote this article in the journal today and um, I use this kind of term like there's no going back to normal. Like, because there's a lot of talk like when things get back to normal. And I think... Uh, Of course, none of us want to be housebound. Of course, none of us want to be afraid of touching each other or going near each other. So we do want to go back to normal in one sense. But the other sense is my sense of normal was that we were on a road of catastrophe, um, particularly with ecology. But beyond that, uh, inequality of uh, billionaire wealth hoovering up um, the resources of the world at the expense of workers and you know, I'm thinking of people in supermarkets right now earning minimum wage and being afraid of their health. And there's loads of money in the world. There's loads of money for the dirt, the, the nurses, and um, for everybody. So it's about equality and distribution and ecology, equality. Um, and I just feel like, you know, I feel like I don't want to go back to all that. I don't, I, I'm, yeah. you know, we've been affected by the housing crisis to some extent and we're still renters and all that. But like, Health and housing are fundamentals of a country and of a democracy and of a republic. So, feck going back to that chaos. Let's forge a new one. That's what I'm into. Yeah, I think for me, um, I've been thinking a little bit about this because, you know, you know, you know, the whole idea of the phrase "we're all in this together." You know, yeah. and that's been going round and round in my head and. And I think we've, and I think the government, I think, you know, people have done a good job. But for me, it's like, we're all in this together until we're not. So, yeah. and it's that piece of when things return to normal, we're yeah. not longer in it together. Is that, you know what I mean? So it's yeah, like, if we're all in it together now, can we not all stay in it together? So for me, um, rather than criticize, I suppose, framing or narrative or how, or how we want to talk about how, you know, the state has managed the response and stuff. My hope is that um, through this crisis, a lot of people that didn't really connect with the struggles of other people will learn something for the very first time. So, you know, whether it's their government, Fine Gael, whatever, that being faced with having to make these really big decisions um, about rent, about housing, about health, that if they never had to actually make them decisions before, is this a time for growth within them in understanding what inequality and equality and equity can look like? 
what can a national health service look like? Like, so these things are achievable yeah. and now they're having to be forced to see how achievable that they are. And I'm glad that they're taking that leap and they're taking them steps and they're not resisting the narrative yeah. that they've told themselves for years. Yeah. And they're going, no, we need to step into this. So I'm hoping it's not step in, step out when we return to normal. I'm hoping it's we're stepping into this and yeah. wow, Jesus, we've really had to be in face now with the reality that, you know, Airbnb has disappeared. Look, we do have homes for people. Look, we do have um, a better way to do a rental market, vacant sites. Yet we do have, you know, a one tier health system and the world, apart from obviously having to deal with the outcome of the coronavirus, just seeing that as a separate thing right now. But beyond that, you know, their lives haven't collapsed because they've introduced a new way of doing things. So often, I suppose, if you're doing this something that, that the same way for a hundred years because you have the same two parties, they're afraid to step into new ways of thinking because the, the, it's it how they think has been so institutionalized over generations and generations of the party that to to think outside of that is so mind boggling. But now they've been forced to. And they have and they've responded. So I'm hoping that this is a new space for them to, to, to be policy makers in and legislators in and see how quick we can actually introduce legislation and see how quick we can actually create a health system that responds to, to high numbers of people with, with, with um, you know, health needs. So I'm, I'm seeing it as a time for hope even though it's a time we wish we weren't in, in a sense, in terms of people's lives being, you know, dramatically impacted. But I do hope it's a time for hope in terms of how we make decisions as a society so that people um, can live together in a meaningful and, and way and a way that they're connected to their country and that they can flourish within their own communities. You know, so I'm hopeful. Amen. <laughs> And I hope you get re-elected. I'm hopeful of that. <laughs> well, we'll see you next week. Next week, I'll be like, fuck that hope, shy, and see the system. Fuck that too. <laughs> here, here, here. Mind, mind your language on my live stream now. Are we not, are we not, are we not at Watershed yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have 27 minutes to Watershed. Uh, um... Well, listen, Lynn, you're, um, you're more than welcome to hang in the background there and mm -hmm. I, I can mute you and because I'm about to bring in our, our next guest, if that's uh, okay. Or you're more than welcome to go off to the disco or wherever you're going. No, to, me, to me. I'm, I'm after bringing me ma out for the night to a book lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where is she? Bring her into the screen there. Hang on, bring her in. If Colm doesn't mind waiting for us a minute. Actually, I'm going to bring Colm into the frame so, here. Me ma's all dressed up. She's in her best pajamas, glass of wine. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> You're famous on the Facebook. <laughs> Does she want to chat? No, she doesn't. No, fair enough. This is like that uh, goggle box or something. Yeah. <laughs> want me, Ma would be a great goggle box uh, guest. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got Colin McEnumra joining us now. Colin, you're upside down. Um, Am so, I upside down? Okay. Yeah, well, like, I don't know, like... Um, yeah, well, it's not the first time we've already now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the world is upside down. Listen, Lynn, thank We're you better. so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm delighted this has actually happened because there were a few moments today I was having the wobbles and um, <laughs> you're... Uh, you're a star, and uh, see, your ma's actually not really watching this. She's got to tell you. Am I not ready? All right. How are you, Dara? Oh, How's it going? Well. Right. How's it going? Right, Lynn, I'm going to move over to Colm here. Stay there. Colm, follow you. Come on, get to Come on. How's the men? Oh, Grant. Oh, Grant. Yeah. So uh, everybody listening uh, in different countries, I'd love to know where you are if you want to comment. Um, I definitely have people in the UK and Vermont and elsewhere. Uh, Colin McEnumra, one of Ireland's finest musicians, yeah, one yeah. of Ireland's <laughs> wisest souls, and uh, <laughs> one of, uh, one of the, the kindest men I know. And uh, look at the kind smile on him there, looking in at us. Uh, and he's coming live. Mars Pride, <laughs> <laughs> 
I sure and, look at he's he's never off the live stream in these yeah. days. Himself. He's been doing a few like a virus, Rory, right? like a virus. <laughs> so Colin was due to have a couple it's of very big games actually in the last few days. Thank you, buddy. He's been doing a bit of live streaming, and um, Colin's actually in the book. And um, there's a a bit where I go visit Colin, and um, <laughs> that he says a lot of wise stuff. And um, please read about that. And um, also famous for his 30 years in the frames, 30? Yeah, 30 years this year. Yeah. Yeah. Talk the day over what, 38? Well, this, oh, we are very kind. I was, I was nine years old when I started. <laughs> I had to do a 10 year stint in Kila first before you got into the frames. I did actually, yeah. I mean, it's funny. Uh, I started busking on Grafton Street when I was 15 years old, so and that was 35 years ago nearly. Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, you're transcending time and space, I think. Well, that's that's music for you. Music is the only known cure for gravity. I like it. Oh, like look, it. my lighting designer is here, making some adjustments. Oh, like like yeah, you're good, you're good, you're running. <laughs> well, um, do you want to say a few words about where we're at in this uh, in this moment in the flying spaceship around the cosmos that we call Earth, or do you want to? It's, like, uh, it's really um, it's really profound. I think you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think it's uh, it struck me earlier that like it's so historic, really, that we're the the, the idea of kind of the the collective vulnerability. And I think that's what Lynn was talking about as well, as regards, you know, that it's it's a really there's a really potential that the, the the moment is full of potential. Um mm -hmm. and you know, and I, I think it's so pressing with with um your book as well, is that I think it, th this is really a echo echoing of the time we were in post the, the, the Celtic Tiger crash and all that economic crash and austerity and very bleak times but so so in a way this the the timeliness of your book is is profound it coming out at this moment i think and so if ever there was a kind of a a time for something that that could kind of strike the note and for it to resonate is 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 uh, is now you know but um and also it's kind of struck by you know people talking online because obviously that's how we're communicating these days um so many of people were talking about like um how tired they were, you know, and I, I, and I, myself and and Sheila, my wife, were like talking about this as well, and just uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the strange kind of uh, stretchiness of time at the moment as well, as regards kind of <laughs> slowing up and <laughs> speeding up and slowing down, and and actually like it reminded me very much of um, the <laughs> stages of grief <laughs> that we're in. You know, it's it's kind of like a, like walking in water or something, so that it's very. You know, it's very hard to kind of maintain any task or to get anything done or to feel like you're very productive or anything. And I think uh, so, you know, thankfully, I mean, we're, we're us lads, we're in a lovely, uh, you know, checking our privilege of being in rural County Wexford in Ireland and we have space around us and every day we've been going to our neighbouring uh, farmer, Shane St. Anne. Um, yeah, that's them. Yeah, and we move the yos and the lambs and uh, we'll we'll feed them. Yeah, this guy's an expert shepherd. Sure. Right. And uh, so we've been doing that. And that's been a great kind of, puts a kind of shape on our right. day. Um, right. yeah. So it's been brilliant <laughs> for that uh, because outside of school, if it wasn't for that kind of, um, it wasn't for that kind of like structure, I think things would be a lot more difficult for, for this fellow here uh, next yeah. to me. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be terrible if we can so Derek, Derek's turned into. A, have you turned into a shepherd, Derek? Yeah, I know. He's he's a trainee farmer now for the past couple of years. He's very. He puts his overalls in on a, every day and like there's a stick and everything and his hat and everything. Yeah. We could do it a lot. We could do it a lot more farmers these days. <laughs> get our food yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I hear you, Colin. Like, I remember you saying the same similar stuff around the potentiality of the moment. I think a lot of crisis and upheaval does that. It breaks down, breaks down the systems and it opens up um, windows. And we either seize those windows or we don't. And one thing that also came to me on this hitching trip around Ireland, um, two moments of meeting historians, just randomly meeting historians, 
that encouraged me to think not in the moment uh, per se or not as a week or a month or a year or a decade even or not even a century sometimes mm. that Ireland uh, I remember one of them saying is in perpetual crisis and it has been for many centuries and that is the story of humanity is that the shit inevitably does hit the fan and the more in some sense we can resist that the shit is going to hit the fan then the more we can actually deal with it and process it as it emerges in the moment and accept it and embrace it despite the pain of that moment. Mm. Well, I suppose, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the Buddhist idea of like a pain is a, 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 the inevitability of being attached to things, you know, and attached <laughs> to outcomes, attached to possessions. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I think there's a huge shock going through everybody's lives with, with the, you know, so many people are out of work, worried about their rent. Not everybody uh, has the, the, the conscientious landlord or haven't yet perhaps been con yet contacted by their conscientious landlord who's going to be very generous to them and understand that that kind of, um, so there's a huge amount of anxiety. And, um, but at the moment, obviously at the same time, there's a huge amount of, uh, you know, the impossible <laughs> has happened over the past week as regards the health service, um, the getting rid of trolleys, uh, the, as you're talking about Airbnb, the, the housing. Um, so suddenly a lot of the, the, the systemic kind of um, uh, truth, you know, uh, has fallen, you know, and, and all of these kind of, you know, I'm reminded of the saying, you know, the, you know, yesterday's, um, yesterday's heresy is or today's heresy is tomorrow's orthodoxy and i think we're definitely at that point where there's a kind of um you know there there, there won't be i would hope we won't be we certainly we won't be going back to where we were but hopefully we can go a few forwards to somewhere more equitable and uh, where a community and is re-established and you like that that, 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 that magical guy yeah. Martin, right, right. yeah but it kind of moving away from individualism you know, yeah. and that's because I think the that's all been yeah. a construct of people nice. buying shit, you know, and yes. um, that they don't need, and that kind of, uh, and then the yeah. inflated oh, markets, yeah. and it's been a kind of a spiral and a, a downward spiral. So this is kind of what I feel like it's kind of like a, a correction. Yeah. You know, I was out yeah. walking the other day and I saw a, a thrush, mm -hmm. and like <laughs> I didn't recognize the shape for a minute, <laughs> and on a, on a gable of a, a shed up the road. And for, for a minute, and then I was just really struck um, by the fact that these are, uh, this is a bird that there would have been like three or four at least visiting my garden in Dublin, that like is, that, every day. That. And like, so the thrush is gone, you know, out of our everyday lives. So it's kind of like, so all of these kind of bits of nature have been disappearing for the past decades. Um, and we haven't, we've been too in a hurry to notice these things. and. In a way, perhaps we're reminded that we, you know, far be it, like we are nature, you know. So the more we crush nature, where it's a, it's kind of sawing away at the branch we're all sitting so, on. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's you know. So hopefully we can we can um, this can uh, pull us together and uh, we can rebuild and out with the old and in with the new. <laughs> Amen to that. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Um, would you like, like to play some music? Yeah, <laughs> uh, on a journey. <laughs> Great, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll play a piece uh, I wrote recently about an uh, amazing trip I did to. Uh, I was in uh, the Middle East. I was in uh, Palestine and Israel with uh, Colin McCann and Narrative Four and an amazing group <laughs> called Telos. And uh, so this is some music that kind of Ooh. arrived. It's called uh, the Minbar of Saladin. And uh, yeah, that's why I buy it. That's why that, right? Right, So you'll be able to hear kind of echoes of uh, echoes of the, the streets. This is somewhere between the rhythm, kind of comes from the second part in uh, Nablus. <laughs> Nablus. Hey, Dark, why don't you, you have a seat back oh, here, remember? Oh, oh, sorry. We talked about this, buddy. <laughs> have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> 
Thank you, Colm. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <Okay. Roll! laughs> Thanks, Darok. Hi. Hi. Thanks for shepherding. Um, my mother's watching in Spiddle and uh, she's texting me in requests. I'm like, oh, yeah. you can't be asking requests here. Like, anyway, so say hello to me, Mammy, uh, Anne in Spiddle. Uh, Hi, Anne. And uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, that was a stunning piece of music, Colm. Um, can, can you speak a little bit about what you um, witnessed in uh, Palestine and Israel and, and how, because I'm conscious of, um, we're, we're thinking a lot of ourselves at the moment and rightly so on our own country, but uh, think of the people of Yemen and the people in the direct provision centers at the moment and uh, people on the Greek Turkish border and the people in Gaza, <laughs> yeah. like, you know. I know we're, we're talking about, um, you know, the limited numbers of respirators and, and you know, some countries, you know, like we might have, I don't know, hundreds possibly, but um, some countries have less than five, you know. Uh, so God knows what's going to happen, really. I mean, uh, and I suppose the thing that's interesting about, uh, you know, and then you have kind of continuing sanctions and stuff on countries like Iran, and um, that just is compounding their ability to be able to. Uh, get medical supplies and get access to them as well. So I think there's a there's a huge. I think there's a. It's in a way that the the the, the mask has slipped, on um, on all these. Uh, and I think that once we've seen these things, we won't be able to unsee them. And I think that's gonna. And the fact that collectively we're having this experience together, I think the possibilities of actually addressing it and doing the right thing. But I mean, obviously, like the coronavirus and all that is a, an existential threat to all of us. So, I mean, if the, we're only as strong as the weakest link. So there's, there is a country where the, the thing is actually like a wildfire. It's only a matter of time before it's going to come back to us. So we really need to, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to kind of get over um, nationality and to, to, to think of, you know, the human race rather than any other nonsense, you know? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Good. Good. <laughs> busy, 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 busy. You're gonna sing a song? Uh. <laughs> no sign of Oshin's not around, is he? Yeah. Oshin. Yeah, he's he's the, he's he's probably on a screen, Rory. You know, teenagers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's he's been making quite a name for himself recently as well, John Sheehan and. Oh, yeah, I know. Do I see? It's great. It's brilliant. 
Pivot is a young son, and uh, he's a great musician as well. Um, yeah. Um, Dara, Dara plays the cello as well. Do you play cello, Dara? <laughs> will, we, will we knock a tune out of him? Or? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, Let's really? see, I, I, hear some, I hear some footsteps pushing. Oh, oh look, we're speaking to the devil. Oh, how's it going? Yeah. Oh, oh, there's the man. Artist. On the screen watching the, watching the live stream anyway. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, I'll be watching you watch. <coughs> so I've, uh, I've got yeah. a knock on the virtual door here. Uh, I've got Francis Black knocking on the, the old Great. internet machine. So uh, I'm going to bring her into the mix here. And um, Colin, um, if you want to, like, we're making this up as we go along, everyone, in case nobody guessed. It's, Pretty obvious at this <laughs> but uh, do you want to hang back there, or do you need to? Sure. Go to or do you want to? Do you what? Would you do you feel called to do another tune now? I think. I mean, I'm always up for one of your tunes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll 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 do I'll do a tune and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll skip away. Okay, good man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Colin. No problem. And a big welcome to Francis. I can see her pop mix here, but her screen's black. So Francis, you're there. Have a look. Your your screen has gone black. Uh, hopefully very apt. So this is uh, the finish line I'm going to play for you. It's a song I wrote um, a couple of years ago in Helsinki and in a state of um, homesickness and over touring. And uh, so this is for everybody who's stuck in anywhere that's away from home or they're thinking about home or missing their families. Also, there's a there's a twist. There's an Italian twist to this at the moment. So we'll see. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. 
the boss. Garamaha got Callum. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that, Callum. Was, uh, you know, we, we'll do it again in uh, when we're all not socially distanced. And well done. Slides Thank it. you so much. <laughs> Slam and ish. Hey, Reston. Hey, what? So, uh, stunning music, Colin McAnomara. You can check him out. I was going to say on Spotify, but uh, I certainly encourage people to buy his album, colinmcanomara.com. If you Google it, you'll figure out the spelling and so on. Um, just stunning music. And I think it's also a time to support artists right now because uh, many, many artists have lost their gigs, many freelancers, many craftspeople, um, tradespeople, many people in all professions. Um, but I, I certainly know a lot of people that are in the arts and uh, are dependent on their, their gigs. And in an age where there aren't so many CD sales and stuff, it's, it's really important. I guess that applies to booksellers as well, and particularly the smaller independent ones. Um, and again, I just want to say a reminder, thanks to everybody for tuning in from around the world. Uh, thanks to Eason's for co-hosting this for The Wheel, also who have it on their stream. Uh, Gil Hess, Chelsea Green, everyone involved. If you have any questions about the book, I'm going to be answering those in a while. Um, I know Johnny Sheehan has put in a question about how long it took to write the book. The quick answer is too long, or, or maybe it was the exact right amount of time. Uh, but we'll talk about that and, and more in a while. And uh, certainly feed in your questions. And uh, Susan is going to be handing me a few of them and I'll do my best to answer them. But I'm definitely up for talking about the book if you have questions about the topics, the issues, the format, the process, any of that kind of stuff. And um, it's appreciated. If you've just tuned in, you've randomly stumbled into the gaff and you've no idea what the hell's going on or who the hell I am or what are you looking at, uh, it's, it's definitely not the... Late, late show anyway. <laughs> um, it's the virtual book launch of Hitching for Hope, a journey into the heart and soul of Ireland uh, by me, Rory McKiernan. Um, but it's also a community gathering for these times, uh, talking about some of the issues that we're all facing, um, some of the turbulence that is in our lives at the moment, but also uh, the strength and spirit of community, of resilience, and how we might generate, activate, and cultivate hope uh, individually and collectively. And um, Someone that gives me a lot of hope is uh, Frances Black. She has been a musician for a long time. She's a, a, a therapist. She, um, she's a charity founder of the Rise Foundation. And in recent years, she be, got elected as an independent senator. And I would definitely say she is hands down one of her finest and best politicians in the land. I suspect she doesn't like being called a politician still. I don't know. But... Uh, or Lynn, I don't know if you, how you feel about being politicians, but we need good politicians. I'm delighted to have uh, senators like that in our country. I feel really blessed that we have uh, scrutinizing legislation and speaking up for those that aren't in position to do so on so many issues in France, including Palestine in particular, uh, but homelessness and addiction. And our, one of our favorite joint uh, campaign issues is the role of the alcohol industry in Ireland and the role that alcohol plays in Ireland. Not that we're necessarily against alcohol, Lynn having her drink there, enjoy it, and anyone else enjoy it. Um, but certainly, I don't think many people can't argue that it has a disproportionate effect on misuse and abuse in our land and on our, the soul of the people and also the resources of the land, and particularly a and &E and our hospitals and so on. So, um, um, Francis, myself, many others, Alcohol Action Ireland, so many advocates, are Lynn's also involved in standing up to the lobbyists, standing up to big business, standing up to those that are trying to push young people into drinking at a very, very young age. And it's all well and good for the Irish people to be known as great crack and great drinkers, but we're way more than that. And we have many other ways to celebrate, including with the old chamomile tea. <laughs> <laughs> so Francis, welcome to the virtual uh, Propaganda. <laughs> How is it going, Nori? Good to hear. Look, I have your book here. Fantastic. Oh. Absolutely loved, loved, loved it. I have to say, really so easy the, reading it. And I'm not a great book reader, Rory, but this one was so enjoyable and so easy to read. Honest to God, I recommend it to everybody. I really mean that. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, 
And what what do you feel? Um, what struck you, Francis, about um, thematically, or was there anything that stood out in terms of? Well, I think what I loved about it, you know, for me, and you know, I, I loved where you were going, and I loved the fact that you were around traveling around the west of Ireland, and you really described the beauty of Ireland. But it was the stories. I just loved the stories. I mean, even just that chapter, find and demo. I mean, that for me, I have to say now. I have to say now. I'm not, I'm, I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag here, and I won't say anything to people because people have to read it. But the whole, you know, uh, the way you described it, it's about Inish Boffin. It's about being on Inish Boffin for the day. And I think for me, like, you know, the way I, I know Inish Boffin really well, so I think I, I really connected with it, but it was the stories, all of the stories, the way you met Brendan, you know, and Brendan making you the porridge. And, oh, and, 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 what, yeah. and what that, and what that in Ireland. I don't know. What felt like when you were so hungry after coming out of a freezing cold tent, yeah. after a storm, wiping you out of it, and it was first thing in the morning, coffee and porridge. I mean, that image was just for me amazing and his story and Brendan's story you know and then Roisin's story you know about her 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 connection with spirituality and uh, uh, Michael you know yes a young woman who I bumped into that I, I'd met once before once or twice and she randomly bumped into her on Inish Boffin while I was trying to find Damien Dempsey because I'd heard he was yeah. on the island and uh, the book <laughs> after called Finding Demo those who don't know in the US or as her demo is an Irish folk legend and um, but yeah. I was chasing him around the island trying to find him didn't find him anyway I, well I kind of did in, the, in another way I'll tell you about that again but uh, yeah. I bumped into Roisin and uh, I asked her what she was up to and she said she was about to become a nun you know yeah. and there's so many different stories of different perspectives yeah and I think I think that's what I loved about the book Rory it's the way you actually just stop people and start talking to them and you know what I find amazing is how they responded to you, you know, how they opened up their hearts and souls to you, how, you know, the, the islander that you met walking along the road and how he, you know, initially was a bit cautious and then realised quite quickly that this was a safe place for him to open up. And I think that's what the book really captures for me. It captures that connection that you have and that the ability that you have to listen to people, to hear their stories, to pull out the best of them, you know, and honestly, it, it's so easy to read as well because you get this, you get so engaged in all of their lives. I think that's what it was really made it really special for me. You get so engaged in everything that they're doing, and and you you you, you want them to do well, if you know what I mean. Um, and it was the way you describe each and every individual, you know, and you you get to know these people so well and you want to know more about them and you want to know what happened then. You have to write a second book, Rory. And you'll have to go back to all the same people. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to you know, it's, it's a dream job, really. <laughs> oh, incredible, incredible. And to travel around to all those beautiful places that you traveled around. I mean, I love, you know, I mean, I was over in Inishbotham. I know Mam's Cross, you know, I know Connemara so well. I was only there last year. Um, you know, just the images are, are, are amazing. I just can't thank you enough. Honestly, I, I would, anybody that can get their hands on this book, I really mean it. It's well worth a read. And, you know, as you know, what's happening here now in Ireland, you know, people are stuck in their homes. Um, yeah. And, you know, the way you have books there that you, you, you know, one of these days I'll get time to read it. Now is the time, you know, now is the time to read it. And you won't be able to put it down. Yeah. We'll put you on the old commission, will we? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, no, you're like I appreciate it. So, um, just um, while we're at it, um, hitchingforhope.com has the links to several websites and bookshops that are selling it and are posting it out. Easton's have it for twelve, eleven twenty-four, eleven euro twenty-four, including postage to the UK and Ireland. Um, but I also encourage people to use uh, independent small bookshops where they can as well. So lots of love to Easton's and all the big Irish companies. Um, but all we're, we're, as we all are at the moment, all in it together. So, so Francis, um, like mental health, addiction, um, so many the kind of personal journey is a lot of your journey and in supporting people. And what do you feel at the moment are important dimensions and aspects to looking after ourselves and navigating some of the anxiety that a lot of us mm -hmm. might be feeling, the uncertainty. 
Well, I have to be really honest with you. Like I, at the moment, I'm kind of doing a lot of work, say by phone and online supporting people. Um, and really, I think the only way we're going to be able to manage this from a mental health point of view, uh, because obviously there's no doubt about how the people are anxious, they're stressed, they're worried, you know, they're worried about their health, but they're also worried about the financial impl implications of it all. And the only thing we can do, I think, is really practice how to be in the moment, how to be in the present, because at this moment, it's all we have. So it's like to, you know, and I, that's not easy to do when you're in that anxious place. You know, it, it can be it can be a little bit hard to do. But if we bring it back to being in the moment and just soak up how what the weather is like, soak up, enjoy small things like, you know, having a cup of tea or ringing your friend you know, staying connected, obviously, with the outside world is, is very important, not isolate, you know, but to enjoy moments that you when you can pick up a book, do things where because you've not there's nothing else you can do, you know, I mean, obviously, if you do go for a walk to not go to a public place where there's loads of people, but go for a walk and enjoy the sunshine, enjoy, you know, without sounding too kind of, you know, mushy, but to enjoy the birds singing, to enjoy the you know the trees blossoming though they're the kind of things that we have to really bring it back into the moment and say you know what there's nothing else we can do there's no point in worrying about tomorrow there's no point in thinking about the past just be in the present and in a way that's mindfulness you know that's about just being mindful and being in the moment and just soaking up what's happening at that very moment um, and I think to also tap into resilience you know like even if you say the word resilience, I can I can get through this. I will be resilient. Tap into that. We all have an inner strength within us that sometimes we have to tap into when when difficult times come like this. So um, and we have we can do it. We can get through this. And I do feel that there is, you know, your book, you know, called Hitching for Hope. You know, I feel there's a, that something hopeful is going to come out of this. You know, and I think Lynn. I just want to say hello to Lynn if she's still listening. I think Lynn tapped into that earlier. There is a lot of hope, I think, where it was like everybody was kind of, it was crazy. It was like a rat race. Everybody was on this runaway train and we all had to, you know, do be doing this and doing that. We, we were becoming human doings instead of human beings, you know? And I feel that now everybody has had to stop and just say, take stock and probably look at what you mentioned earlier decluttering you know decluttering our minds and decluttering our lives and just taking a step back and, and enjoying being if we can be with our families enjoying being with our children you know if, if if it's possible and if we can't then to do it online so I just think that's what's really important everything comes back to being in the moment yeah might just take a pause after that now <laughs> I hope I wasn't too depressing for no, you. No, no, you've got me all relaxed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, yeah, I've, be, I've done a load of radio interviews today, and um, I definitely was a bit wired. You know, I don't yeah. normally get too wired, um, but I look at it's launch day and all that. I was running around the place. Um, yeah. And it's heightened times. There's a lot of heightened energy, isn't it? Oh, it's, absolutely. It's, it's particularly a little bit addicted to the news or was the last week and it's hard mm. not but um yeah you know I think like it's that moment in particular when you wake up in the morning and you reach for that yoke uh, that device and see the what David O'Doherty the comedian said is the shit pipe that you you turn on the shit pipe and look up to it and let all the shit come down on top of you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of social media has turned into that. And uh, I do think it's important to share about injustice as well. But of course. Like, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of goodness happening in the world. I just read on Twitter that there was a whole street out in Dublin cheering all the health workers. And like yeah. you do see uh, flowers blossoming at the moment. And... Yeah. Colin mentioned uh, the birds as well. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, when, when there might be someone watching or listening that goes, well, mindfulness, yeah, I tried that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what do you think, like, for someone that just can't get, slow down the engine or can't find a rhythm with how to detach from some of the, the, the stress? 
I mean, it's not it's not easy when, you know, when you're constantly in a place of, as I say, doing, doing, doing and busy, busy, busy. And, you know, have to have to have to, you know, um, and, you know, and, and we do project a lot into the future. Um, and and that's when anxiety kicks in, because then you think, oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. So I suppose I can only I can only share with you how I do it. I'm not like, don't get me wrong. I, I don't sit and kind of meditate like um, all I do is be in the moment. And if I do go into an anxiety, I bring it back to actually this moment. I'm OK. I'm OK at this moment. Um, and I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I'm not going to think about that tomorrow. Now, we have to obviously plan. You know, we have to plan for our futures and stuff, but we only can do our best throughout the day. And why we're doing our best throughout the day is just to enjoy certain moments. It's not easy, but we have to bring ourselves back. And I do think that um, if stuff gets overwhelming for me, I bring it back to just breathing, you know, and uh, just doing maybe, you know, 20 breaths, 50 breaths, whatever I can manage, whatever I can manage at that moment. And I'll be, immediately I feel relaxed, you know, um, and something just kicks in and I just when we get into an anxious state, our breath gets shorter, you know, and we kind of breathe, we shallow breathe. And that's, you know, your, your heart rate goes up and you start to feel you, the old adrenaline starts to kick in, you know. Um, and it's really important to just take a step back and just take, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 deep breaths and say, I'm going to be OK. I, I'm not going to get into that anxiety now. And I'm just going to take have a cup of tea and uh, or maybe go for a walk or maybe pick up the phone and talk to a friend small little tools you know um to help us just to, to calm our minds you know but i do think this um what's happening at the moment has kind of forced us all to take a step back you know i mean i was on a roller coaster up to a week and a half ago you know with the election and everything um, and then all of a sudden everything just kind of the election campaign my own with the shannon election campaign and all of a sudden uh, it all just stopped you know um, and I had to take a step back, you know, um, couldn't go out, go for little walks, maybe go to the shop and that's it. And it really kind of made me reflect on my life also. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are you, do you find yourself anxious about the next coming days? I know there's the, <laughs> there's the election. Uh, yeah. yeah. Of course. I mean, look. But regardless of that, I'm putting you in. You're in. Let's say you're yeah. in. Visualize. Uh, look, who knows? There's some brilliant people. I know there are. Elected, didn't get elected the last time, you know, in the general election or in the European elections. You know, I, I really, I really have no idea. I really don't know the energy around. I wish I knew. Um, I certainly would be hopeful. But on another level, if, you know, I really would like to get in, but if I if I don't get in, I think I will have I'll be disappointed, but I think I'll have acceptance around it. But I mean, I would I love working in the Shannon. I love working with Lynn Ruan and Alice Mary Higgins, dynamite women, Colette Callagher, you know, um, Pippa and John Dolan. We're in a group called the Civil Engagement. Can we not just make use the government? I know. We a, I mean, those, those women working alongside those women and John, it's their powerhouses. I honestly, it's a real privilege, yeah. a real privilege for me. And I learned so much from them. They are incredible, you know. So look, I don't know what uh, what's going to happen next week. I know next Thursday night, <laughs> you know. So I'll uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. Well, listen. Best of luck to you, Francis. Thanks Thank for coming forward with the book. Um, Thank you, Rory. Good luck. Great, Thank great, you. great book. Thanks so much. Uh, you're welcome to hang back on the stream or uh, you can, um, you know, do your own thing. Okay, <laughs> Rory. Probably just keep things open for another 20 minutes or so. And uh, I'm going to answer a few questions now from people that have been commenting as well. So thanks again, Francis. Appreciate it. And um, sorry. Uh, I'll also give a shout out to the Rise Foundation as well, which is Francis's charity that she set up. So thanks again, Thank Francis. You. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so questions. Uh, thanks for your comments and questions into the Facebook feeds on the streaming across a few different pages. Um, we have uh, Bernie Smith. And um, Bernie, I think that's Bernie in Clitill. How's it going? 
Bernie, thanks for tuning in. Um, Bernie, what was the most memorable part of the book for you? Um, oh, geez. Uh, the most memorable part is finishing it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, I suppose I'm in a different experience with the book than the reader would be at this point in that I was the writer, essentially. Uh, but the things that the book are about um, is maybe what you're referring to and what's in the book. Um, I was on radio, uh, was it this morning or yesterday? Uh, I think it was yesterday. And they asked me um, what was the most memorable story or person I met. And I always try and answer that just with what comes to me in the moment. And it changes day by day, to be honest with you. Maybe that's maybe I have a really bad memory. I don't know. But, um, I'll just try and think what's coming to me at this moment in time. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I suppose like the, the last night um, on the, the hitching around Ireland, uh, there's one uh, chapter on it really, and it's at the Hill of Ishnach, which is the uh, ancient political and ceremonial and spiritual capital of Ireland that most or many people don't know about. Increasingly, they do. It's uh, near Mullingar, it's in the geographical centre of Ireland. We have four provinces in Ireland, um, Munster, Leinster, Ulster and Connacht, but we actually have five in that uh, Ishnak was known as the fifth province and maybe that's where we should have our annual gatherings once again as we once did and still actually in many ways uh, David Clark and Justin and Marty and so many amazing people organize um, a Bialtana uh, fire which is around May 1st or on the eve of May 1st where you light a national fire for the health and well-being of the nation and uh, fires are lit off that fire all on, on hillsides all around the land and I think there's something really special about that, that coming together, a kind of a cleansing and an awakening and a celebration, particularly with the summer season that will be upon us as well. Um, but Ishnak was a place I was very much drawn to. Uh, they say Ireland gets its name from Era, and uh, Era gets its name from Eru, which is the goddess Eru. And they say that's where the goddess Eru lives. And I just was very drawn to go to Ishnak before I finished the trip. Uh, the trip around Ireland had been slightly um, shape shifted in that I got a call towards the end of, from the president's office. I was spent seven years on Michael D, the president of Ireland appointed me to the Council of State. And there was a piece of legislation uh, or the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, which was somewhat contentious, but it followed in the wake of the tragic uh, death of Sabita Halapanabar in Galway Hospital. Um, and there was legislation passed that went some way towards, um, towards the referendum that we subsequently had and passed. And I had to uh, make my way to the Aris ultimately. Now I was given a few days to prepare and was told I had boxes of documents to pick up. And the Aris, the president's office asked me where would they leave the box of documents? And I actually had to reply and say, I didn't know where, because I didn't know where I was going to be. And it just, the whole thing was, a, had a bit of profundity and a bit of lunacy attached to it in that here I was with this responsible role, which I did take very, very seriously. Um, but I decided to cut this trip short at the end, but not before going to Ishnak. And I got there and I went to what's called the Cat Stone. And uh, I was having a little moment to myself where I was actually having a bit of a prayer for Ireland I was thinking of the north, south, east and west and this land and all our land has been through throughout many centuries and millennia um, of <clears throat> injustice really and suffering as we're having now, but our ancestors had during very hard, very hard times. And I was thinking of that, I was thinking of the recession, I was thinking of austerity, I was thinking of all the corruption, the cover-ups, the whistleblowers, all of that. And I was just praying that we can someday transcend that, that can, we can someday get a, a real republic, a country that actually cares and looks after people in the way that we're starting to do now with nationalizing, hopefully, a health service. Let's push that over the line and get a national health service. If we really want to clap for our health workers, let's actually build that. But Ishnak um, tapped me into that consciousness of a, a bigger Ireland and a dream of an Ireland that I wanted. And then... Um, but I was up there and I got a text from um, Owen Ward. I'm not sure if he's watching, but uh, Ward's a great family in Coot Hill. And uh, 
Owen wanted to come visit me. So Owen and Martin and Bennett came and uh, we all camped out together. And we actually ended up meeting a couple of lads up there, Marty and Justin, that are tour guides on the Hill of Ishnock. They do great tours. It's U-I-S-N-E-A-C-H dot I-E, Ishnock. Uh, they do regular tours up there. Hopefully when the dust settles, that will start back again. Um, but I had an amazing night of fire, lit, lighting a fire, uh, camaraderie, sitting around the fire, telling stories as our ancestors would have done hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I feel like that's what we need right now. We need fires. We need to come together. And as soon as this crap is over and we're let loose again, uh, I think we should all go camping on Ishnak and light a big fire and have a few songs and tell a few stories and uh, see where we go from there. So that was a very long-winded answer. I'll try and be briefer. Uh, Kathleen up in Donegal, Kathleen O'Hara Farn, how's it going? Uh, what was, uh, sorry, I can't read Susan's yeah, writing. Oh dear, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Karen. Kathleen. Um, Hang on, say hello to Susan there. Hi. <laughs> Get into the screen. I should be the question reader. Okay, so what <laughs> was the most, uh, poignant moment of the project for you from Maura Elaine O'Grady. Oh God. Um, that wasn't from Kathleen, no? Oh, sorry. I read Maura's first. Well, I'll answer that one. Which what one? was the most poignant part? Moment of the project for you. Moment. Oh God. <clears throat> you know, I met a woman um, who gave me a lift. And again, there were many, many moments, but um, I met a woman who gave me a lift that told me her brother had been killed in a hit and run. And she told me that her parents, it was a long, long time ago, and she told me her parents knew who did it. <clears throat> and the neighbor had sort of had some information around it. And she and her family felt powerless to do anything about that because the people, the culprits were very powerful authority figures in the area and um, I didn't get that much more information from it but this woman in her own life had found a place where she was able to live with that loss grief and sense of injustice that is almost unimaginable how do you contend with that raw injustice um, but I think Sonny Jacobs is another person that comes to mind. She's at the start of the book. Sonny Jacobs is somewhat well known. Um, she wrote an incredible book called Stolen Time. She spent, I think it was 17 years in prison. I, I don't know if she might actually be watching and listening from Connemara. How are you, Sonny and Peter? They run an amazing place uh, called Sonny Sanctuary. And it's pe for people that were faced wrongful conviction. And Sonny and Peter both um, served time. and came together then to do work to support people around wrongful convictions and to find hope. Uh, a lot of it was around meditation and yoga to find a practice in yourself. And I think when I hear stories like that, it gives me hope because no matter what we face in our lives and a lot of us, let's face it, are hit with very, very profound and difficult things. And I know Lynn writes about some of that in her own book, which is well worth checking out and uh, people like us. So, I get a lot of hope from that and I get touched in those moments when people um, have the courage and the trust to share those stories and there's lots of them in the book. So another question, uh, Susan's <laughs> running over to share. Uh, from <laughs> Kathleen O'Hara Fern, what was it like traveling through Donegal where you have family, Derry and the surrounding counties way up here in the north of Ireland? Up Donegal! Um, yeah, my mother's from Donegal and Keenan watching in originally Bundoran Valley Shannon area and I lived, in, I lived in that place for a while and I've written about that in the book because that's where me and Keith Corcoran and Anna Lally, uh, if they might be watching as well up in Lahey, um, we found it spun out that I in Donegal and spent a long time living up there with my grandparents, Mary and Dan and very, very fond of the Northwest and Donegal in many ways is neither North nor South. It's a Southern Republic County, but it's very much cut off in so many ways. But it's, I think it's one of our most special counties and the people there are second to none. And it was certainly a beautiful uh, time to visit there, but I, I got to spend time with my gran, which I write about in the book. And I write about an experience of living with my grandparents for, I think it was around six months or a year I spent living with them. It was during the Iraq war. 
and it was when I first really started campaigning and organizing. Um, but yeah, Derry, I actually ended up in Derry and Letterkenny with Janet Gaynor, first of all, with amazing mentor up there and Anne Sheridan. But went on to Derry and I was there for the 12th of July and uh, amazing people I met, really kind and generous people in the BBC, brought me on an outside road uh, broadcast and brought me to the Orange March. And that was quite a challenging experience for me who grew up um, quite Republican in ways of the border, the militarization of the border, the history of colonialization and to see the Orange Order and the marches and the contention and tension around that and to experience that. But it helped me also see that most people involved in that celebration weren't celebrating the downfall of Catholics or the Cushing or the apartheid or inequalities, which were all very real. And they're actually having a cultural and community celebration, which I know can be very hard to accept sometimes, but it helps me as a, someone who grew up around the border region to see that there's a commonality, a decency and a goodness in us all. Uh, Catholic and Protestant, there's hardly any difference. Like, you know, what's the difference in your God? There's hardly any, it's the same God. And most of us in some ways don't even practice those religions anymore. So it's a lot of it's tribalism, but I think we're all on this one rock. We're all on this one island. And I do want to see a nice Ireland, but I want to see a nice Ireland that's based on camaraderie and peace and equality together. So Derry was a big part of that. And it's, it's in the, a lot of that's in the book as well. So um, next question. Do you want yeah, another to question. Thing? Yeah, yeah, fire ahead. Hopefully this is going all right for you. These are hanging in there. Uh, <laughs> We're, yeah, we'll wrap it up in a wee while, uh, but thanks for staying with me, and uh, we'll do another two my voice is gone, so it's probably a sign that I'm talking too much. It's okay, you're doing great. <coughs> uh, so, a question from Dean Sturry. Ah, oh, Dean's in the book! What was your objective with the book, and did you achieve it? <clears throat> oh, Dean, thanks for the whopper question, man. Uh, yeah, Dean's a good Irish man. He's a good community warrior. Um, I bumped into Dean on Inish Boffin. He was he's part of the demo chapter actually. And um yeah, what was my objective? I didn't plan to write a book, Dean. Um I just did this trip. You, if you, when you read about it, it's just something I did in the moment. I didn't plan to achieve anything actually, um, other than go on a walkabout as an Aboriginal culture. It looked talked about in, in Aboriginal history in many cultures to go on a walk about a wander, a pilgrimage to see what you might find, to maybe reconnect with yourself and reconnect with your people and your land. So that was my objective in one sense. But then when I started to hear these stories, uh, particularly stories of people that don't necessarily have a platform, I suppose an objective uh, emerged that I wanted to share those stories. Um, you know, not to take on their voice or to own their stories, but to become a conduit or a channel or a vessel and to get them onto radio or TV or onto the internet or into a book. And I didn't plan to write a book either. And it was really, really quite a difficult process for me to write a book and finish a book. Um, but I wanted to honor all those people and those stories. And uh, a lot, some people watching and listening at this now, you're in this. And uh, this is for you. This book is for you. And it's your book. And I'm really grateful for you to share your story and to allow your story to go into it. Uh, I reached out to pretty much everybody I met and tried to find people. Even had to hunt down people that I didn't know their names and I still find them. Um, so the, ob the objective is still unfolding, I guess. It's to create a platform uh, for change, for conversation, for community, for connection, for understanding, for inspiration. Uh, for coming together, for rising up, and um, and uh, for love and peace and justice and all the good stuff. So Great. hopefully that answers us a bit of the question, Dean. Thanks for tuning in, man. Appreciate it. Um, next one is from Eastie Britain. Hi, Eastie. How are you, Eastie? Uh, she wants to know on Paris, watching on Periscope, what was uh, your favorite or the most surprising part of the writing process for you and what was the most challenging part of the writing process? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so, Eski, thanks for tuning in. Eski is uh, one of Ireland's best known surfers. She's a legend. She brought surfing to Iran. Um, she's a marine scientist, uh, biologist, I think, conservationist. Um, Check her out, by the way, TED Talks and all the rest, Eastie Britain. Um, 
So most um, challenging part of the book, I referenced this earlier, is sitting on my fat ass and having the discipline to write and particularly then the editing. And it really taught me a lot about the power of discipline. And I know Tony Griffin is watching this. He's a, it was an all-star Claire hurler and a good friend of mine. And it got me thinking about elite athletes in GA or any other sport the discipline that they have to show at getting up at six in the morning when they don't want to, or to go training late at night. And in writing a book is in some ways, anything we really want to achieve in life, we have to show up for and the courage and discipline. So I did find that hard to be honest, because it's easy to go flitting around and also to jump onto campaigns and projects and go running around the place. So, you know, it, it, that was the most challenging part. And what was the other part of the question? Was surprising. the most surprising, um, yeah, um, I don't know if it's the most surprising, but you know, it taught me a lot about what Colin McNamara was talking about, about surrender. And um, it took me a few years to finish it and I had to rewrite it several times. And, and then it got into, and Vanessa O'Loughlin is an amazing woman in publishing, uh, pitched it, helped me pitch it. And uh, she ends up in the book as well. She runs writing.ie and she's been a great encourager, encouragement to me. But um, the book actually got rejected, you know, um, by most Irish publishers, or pretty much all, really. Um, not, I don't know how far we pushed it, but it, it, it definitely, it wasn't one that they were dying to publish. And um, I also thought I'd finish it this month, next month, this year, next year, and I never did. It kept rolling on and on and on. And um, so it kept teaching me to surrender to the process and to the journey. And in a way, writing a book was a journey of the unknown as well. And, you know, I got this email from um, John Ray, who might be watching Chelsea Green Publishing House in Vermont, and they have an office in London. Uh, Matt and Rosie are there in London. And they sent me an email, asked me, would they like, would, it, would, would I be interested in talking to them about publishing it? And uh, I'm a big agent, so I said no, actually, because I was, at that point, it was going to self-publish. Um, but then I realized that I was being an idiot and I uh, decided to chat to them and they've become the publisher and they're amazing. So Chelsea Green, they're really socially conscious publisher. They publish it in the US, Canada, Australia. It's coming out actually in North America and Australia later in the year in May. So, um, but yeah, I suppose surrender and it, it teaches you that in all facets of life that if something maybe isn't working out the way you think it's going to work, just maybe let go and don't just dance with the flow of it. Um, the Tao Te Ching and Taoism and the Tao teaches that as well, just to flow with what is, including the storm of coronavirus or COVID-19 and the, the tension that we're in in this moment is to, to flow with it. I think that's what Tai Chi is and that's what Qigong is. My mother actually teaches Qigong. Um, so I'm not very good at Qigong or Tai Chi, but. I think I've been learning a little bit about flow. Next one. Yeah, geez, I, I'm so blessed to have a very beautiful uh, <laughs> wife to be asking me these questions. From the Cork Life Center, what is the absolute most favorite moment from the book? Uh, well, I wish the Cork Life Center were in it uh, because that's actually one of my favorite places in Ireland. It's an amazing, I don't want to call it alternative school, but it's a school for people that aren't necessarily served in the conventional schooling system or adequately served. I hope I've done justice to that. I probably haven't, but check out Cork Life Center. Uh, I'm really inspired by a visit I had there once, but what was the most um, surprising, was it surprising part? What was your very favorite part of the book? Oh, very favorite part. Um, yeah, the Inish Boffin bit is great crack. The running around looking for demo. Um, I, I, the Council of State meeting wasn't necessarily great crack, but it was a really important thing to be part of the making of Irish history. And I know Francis and Lynn on a deeper, more intensive um, responsibility around legislative legislation, but to be involved in that kind of legislation that was going to make Ireland a better place for, uh, particularly for women, but for all people. Um, that was certainly a, a great honor to be part of that. And I get to write about that a little bit in the book as well. 
Um, I'm trying to think of other, I'm kind of on the spot here and it's been a long day, so forgive me, but. Um, another question? Yeah, I'll go for another question, but. Uh, yeah, I'd say like, use, read the book and find your own favorites. Like my favorite changes in, a, in any given moment, I suppose. Okay, let's do two more questions. Two more questions before my voice goes. She can see me fading here. Two more questions. Okay, <clears> so <throat> we have a question from James McSweeney and then one from Kathy Scott to, to wrap up. So James McSweeney, um, after traveling around the land of Ireland, how would you describe the spirit of the Irish people today? Ooh, the spirit of the Irish people today. Um, I would describe it as I would say heart is a part of it. I don't want to overuse the word injustice, but I think we have taken quite a battering in this country, as most countries actually have in so many ways. Think of Finland even. You know, Finland's been through woeful stuff. And we never talk about that. But Gaza, Yemen, West Papua, Aboriginal people, Native peoples everywhere. But the Ireland, Irish people have been through an awful lot. You know, I'm thinking of the tomb babies, industrial schools, um, our mental health services, people with um, special needs, um, homeless people on the street tonight, too many of them on the street tonight, in hostels. I know friends watching in a direct vision centers in Clare at the moment. Um, but people quite often, a lot of people have a lot of hurt. But side by side to that, in the spirit of the Irish people, is a lot of courage and strength and power. And I feel that in the music in particular, in Colm's music, in the healing power of the music, in Christy Moore's music, in Damien Dempsey's music, in Francis Black, the Black family, there's a raw, wild, fierce, free spirit that we have to hold on to. And uh, I think that's going to get us through now and it'll get us through always. Uh, there's a kindness, there's a decency, there's a camaraderie, there's a communitarianism that wants to look out for each other. Not everybody, mind you, but there's enough of us in it. And uh, I think that's there for us to to further take and, and to not take for granted and to amplify it. And it gives me a lot of hope. And uh, I'm feeling it very much alive at the moment in Ireland. I'm feeling a raw energy around Irish people's spirit and strength and courage to overcome. And that's people everywhere as well. Like there's, you know, that's the human experience, but um, Ireland has overcome a lot and we'll overcome more and we'll, I, I think we're on the threshold of something. I do believe, I know some people don't believe that we can turn things around, that we can actually have a, a really functioning country with all the services that we need and housing and so on. But why can't we start it? If we have the will, the strength, the vision, the commitment and the leadership, people like Lynn and Francis, and there are people in all parties, by the way, I will say that there are all people in all parties doing their very best given it their all at this moment. And so I respect and I salute that. Um, I don't know, he's probably, uh, I don't know, he's fallen asleep on the couch yet, uh, or are we still alive? I don't know if anybody's tuning in. <laughs> I might be talking to myself at this stage. Uh, do you want to hear a bit of a bear on? <laughs> probably not. Um, I was thinking of that when I was thinking of the clapping. Um, I was thinking of the clapping because, uh, I was thinking, what am I going to do? Clapping on a live stream like uh, that? Just, it, I don't know how that was going to work. So I was going to bow on into the screen. So I'll, I'll give thirty seconds bow on to to give my uh, voice a break. This is the Irish spirit. There are other questions, but it's it's getting late. 
face and we She's making me wrap up. Jesus. To remind the fella. Uh, okay, <laughs> so this question is from the amazing Kathy Scott. Kathy. What message of hope would you like to share for the people of our planet now? What message of hope would you like to share? Um, yeah, I suppose what's coming to me is back to um, that last question. Um, who asked that last question? Kathy. No, the last one. Oh, James. Spirit, James's, James's James question. James. Yeah, I think the spirit is the thing to tap into, you know. That's where hope is. The spirit is in the belly. It's in the soul of the individual. And then it's in the collective. And then it's in the air. And it's, I think it ripples through like a consciousness when we connect all those dots together. Um, but we kind of need to plug into the internet of that spirit, you know, where we can kind of tune in and log on to all these technology platforms but are we really actually connected to our own soul spirit and when we are we can tune into this deeper wider more powerful internet of life and i think when we do that's where we get hope and i think more people are waking up to this sensibility of connectivity and interconnectivity and interdependence and um, and i think ecology is teaching us that that we are part of an ecosystem, a fragile ecosystem that uh, we're dependent on water, we're dependent on sky, earth, food, we're dependent on a diverse range of ecosystems. There's obviously a lot of talk around bees at the moment. Um, and I think like the more people that are firstly aware of that interconnectivity, um, then and secondly, the more people that act on that awareness, and I feel there's a rising there's a potentiality that is there at the moment that gives me huge hope. And uh, you all give me huge hope because I know there's so many incredible people that I'm aware now are tuned into this. Kathy Scott, the likes of Francis Lynn Collum, uh, Luke Concannon's watching in. Uh, I think Chuck Collins might be with him over in the US. Um, and like Sonia Ronan in Canada, there's so many people. And I wanna give a shout out as well to Helena Close, who's launching a book tonight and to Rick Gilligan and to my friend Michael McRae and all the people at Narrative 4. I actually work with an organization as a European director of an amazing organization that ultimately is about hope and kindness and connectivity and stories called Narrative 4. Uh, Colin McCann, Lisa Consiglio, our co-founders. And I just know, I feel part of this community, this tribe, this movement. I'm so inspired by all you people making things, doing things, sharing things. Um, and hopefully you can share the book as part of that, but there are so many other things in the mix. And I'm not encouraging you necessarily to go write a book, um, but do make something, you know, make a poem, make a song, make a story, make a community uh, venture of sorts, a garden or, or connect with the neighbors and look out for the old folk at the moment as well in particular. I know I need to do better myself, but I think this is time creativity rather than consumption that if we're just consuming a news feed of despair, um, that's, that doesn't bring us anywhere. So I think to transform that flow of um, tension and maybe the risk of it being a negative force is to see that as a fire and you as the blacksmith in the fire to forge a sword of hope and a sword of possibility. And I think that's ultimately that will create a rise in consciousness for our planet. And I think now's the time because we are hurtling off an ecological cliff. We are given several years to sort this out. This could be a window in which we seize it. And I think we can, you know, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. I'm not saying there's not a lot of suffering or sickness and death and dying at the moment. I've heard of someone dying today. Somebody's dad died in isolation. And I'm so sorry for that person and that family. And I know, Lynn, if you don't mind me saying so, um, lost um, one of her grandparents recently. So I, give a, I want to salute you and your family, Lynn, and anyone at the moment that might be struggling with that um, sense of disconnection from family and loved ones. Um, let's just mind each other in it all and um, text each other, email each other, phone each other, do the old Facebook crack and, uh, you know, just have a bit of crack as well. We're still allowed to have fun, you know, we're still allowed to get the old barons out. Um, so uh, get the old music going and have a dance party in your house when no one's looking. And um, 
I've been hearing all these people that aren't getting dressed. There's probably naked people watching this tonight, is there? Hands up who's naked. Comment there. And don't upload any photos, it'll all be censored. Um, and uh, yeah, I, oh, the one thing I'll say is, I, I did hear all these naked people that don't get dressed for work and they're going on the live streams and all that. But there's even people that don't put on any shoes, uh, you know, and like this kind of crack. <laughs> have these crazy furry slippers. Ah, oh, there's Lynn is shaking her foot at me. Um, yeah, I have these crazy slippers I got in and um, I got in the hinge. I actually highly recommend them. I'll take one off. They're, they're super cozy. 20 euro when the shop reopens in the hinge. Really cozy. Um, so um, I'm getting a couple of messages into me now and I will finish up. Um, big love to my family, to Sinead, who's just had her baby into Barry. Lots of love to you. And I hope you don't mind. Can I say the baby name? Maybe Susan. I won't say the baby name. Uh, Tony and all the lads watching in, and uh, these are all my wider family. You're all the tribe. Um, uh, Mairead and Bertie, my uh, mother and father-in-law, up the Ula Posse, Milltown Malby, my in-laws there, the Quirks and the Downses. These are all lovely legends, and I can't wait to see you all when we get out the other side of the madness. And um, I actually want to invite uh, another special guest um, up, if she'd come up and maybe finishes off with a few words or meditation or whatever she feels like. And if you bully or, or no, we won't use the word bullying. Um, but I have, somebody has messaged me asking her to sing her song. She does not like being put in the spot, but um, it might come to her, it might not. Um, but she is an incredible singer. Susan Quirk, Spotify, YouTube. She's got four, four release songs, singles out. And uh, she's one of my biggest inspirations, gives me hope. And uh, I really love her and she's really helped me a lot today and every day. And uh, yeah, I'll invite her onto the stage, ladies and gentlemen. No, don't stay there. Oh, I can stay here. Yeah. She's not going to sing. No, I, think I so. wish I could hear everybody going, sing, sing. I, well, what I can do is what I'm actually getting a lot of messages um, on right now is that a lot of people are saying we need to make this uh, I need a to thing. Go and pee, sorry. Oh, don't leave me. I need pee. You're in charge. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, I'm getting a lot of messages saying, can you hurry up and pee, please? Yeah. Don't abandon me. Yeah, go on. Like um, what I'm hearing is that a lot of people want to uh, potentially look at making this a weekly thing. Um, Rory's just been setting up the technology for this over the last 48 hours. Um, so it's there and it's ready to go. So if uh, any of you uh, think it would be a good idea to make this a weekly thing, uh, drop us a comment and let us know and sure what else would you be at only connecting and having a crack and speaking with very wise beautiful conscious souls very telling me to talk about meditation um so i am a meditation teacher as well i'm a big ad advocate for meditation um when i started implementing a daily meditation practice into my life uh, my life genuinely started to change um Really, I think the core of it is, is that it connected me with my power. Um, a lot of the bullshit and things that weren't really serving me in my life just started to fall away very organically and naturally. And I moved into a place of strength and connection with myself. Um, and yeah, I just started moving my life in a different direction. So much so that I went uh, and did a big deep dive into it and traveled to New York and to Australia to train how to become a meditation teacher. So um, everyone can meditate. It's really, really simple. Uh, we need to demystify what meditation is and all of these lovely practices. All they are really is uh, a, a way and a means and a method to connect with the self, to turn inwards. Um, so much uh, of the time, quite often we're focused externally. We're we're receiving information from the external world, be it information, relationship dynamics, all that kind of crack. Um, and sometimes the relationship we really need to cultivate is the relationship with ourselves to just actually turn inwards and go, how am I really, how is my soul on this life? How is my soul on this earth right now? How am I? How am I? And to really turn the dial inwards and to, to breathe into that space, to breathe into your heart, your own consciousness, 
And the more you do that, the more it kind of energizes your system and you can, you, you'll can notice your own awareness and your consciousness rising um, and life can feel sweeter as a result of that. You can engage with life in a more powerful way, in a way that feels authentic and meaningful to you. Um, so anyway, I won't talk about it too much longer, but I am an advocate for meditation. So if anyone wants to learn how to meditate, um, there's loads of people teaching meditation out there in the world. There's loads of videos online. Just check it out and just give it a go. Um, you can contact me if you want uh, any info on it as well. So that's my my spiel, unprepared spiel on meditation. Uh, she's brilliant. She's, and he's just had his pee now. <coughs> she's the one that ha should have her own show. Okay, hey, hey, don't, 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 don't come back. Come on. Come on. Yeah, she's telling me to wrap it up. Um, we have to go to an ad break now. Uh, we've no sponsors at all for this show. Um, this lad costs fortune. We're paying him by the hour and ever he's on the double shift, double time shift. Uh, so um, I had a sneaky, I had a pee, and and uh, I I had a quick peek at the comments, and uh, a load of people are going sing, sing, sing. And ah, uh, come on. No. No, come on. I don't feel like singing right now. Okay. But if you do a show next week, I will do. I will sing next week. So. Okay. If you want another thing next week, we could do like a 20 minute, half hour thing or something. Yeah, She's right. committing to sing or a three hour thing. <laughs> um, she will sing then. But in the meantime, Susan Quirk on YouTube, her website, all that crack. Um, and um, can I just, before we go, um, can you just read out, tell me where people are, are commenting, where they're from and different countries where? in the comments oh. there. Uh, I just want to make sure I give the big thanks. To, this is the boring bit, but I'll be quick. Um, Chelsea Green, Gil Hess, Vanessa Lachlan, all the proofreaders, the editors, it like there's millions of people that helped make this, you know, um, there, there's like a couple of hundred people tanked in the back here. And um, I want you to know that like Ronan, Carol, Marie, Duffy, Jody, Doreen, Simon Ward, especially um, Barry Dempsey, Stephen Ray, all the lads, all the Coot Hill heads, you're all tanked. And I uh, Really grateful to you all. And the book is Hitching for Hope. Um, it's available on all the bookshops, which are all closed. So you can't get it, but you can go on to the internet and feck and order it with your mommy's credit card or your daddy's credit card. Uh, ask before you use it. But uh, yeah, Easton's, as I say, it's 11.24, but uh, Waterstones, the Brave, I don't know, who's all the other bookshops? Um, gutter books, all the small ones, Kenny's have it. Um, so please buy it. And remember, Christmas is only around the corner. So uh, maybe buy a few for um, the old stocking fillers. And um, actually a few companies I've heard have bought a batch of books to give to staff as presents. And um, so I'm turning into an awful salesman here trying to peddle the book. But look at, stick with me, the bookshops are bleeding closed. Who in the history of humanity has launched a book when the bookshops are all closed? Um, so, but that's solidarity going out with uh, Helena Close and Limerick there, Ruth Gilligan, friends of mine, also launching books. A lot of people had the wind knocked out of them in the last week or two. And uh, let's all just row behind each other, support each other's projects, our music, our campaigns, whatever it is we're doing. And um, Oh, there's, I just got a message in from Lee in Narrative 4, and he's up in Connecticut, and uh, he's a legend as well, and these are all legends. And I'm on the Ireland Twitter account this week, at Ireland, so uh, if you need any good stuff shared, I'll do my best, I can't promise you. Um, I got a lovely message from Michael D today, supporting the book, uh, the President of Ireland. Um, Sarah's message in to suggest that I call the Teddy after Michael D. I will decline that because I just, this is not a Michael D. Teddy, but um, I do feel uh, grateful to have Michael D. as a president at this time. And um, he's one of our, our wiser souls. And I'm just trying to think of any thank yous before I kind of run out of steam here, which I am. But listen, um, that catchphrase, we're all in it together. That is the, the rally cry of our moment, of our time right now. Um, so let's mind each other. And I'm just gonna do one final check from Susan, if there's anything I need to do. I don't want to go now. I miss you all. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I can see Lynn Rowan has stayed on and uh, I've muted her. They never did that in the Shannon though, but did they mute you? I'm going to unmute her and see if she want to like uh, sing us out. <laughs> Back. Unless she's are unless she's are ready for two pack, I would say no. <laughs> you probably had a bottle of wine in the middle of all this, haven't I you? Have, and I had two glasses, but can I just say I stayed with you because I know what it's like to launch a book, and if whoever was there to launch my book walked off the stage, I'd fucking course them for the rest of their lives. So I was like, I'm staying on stage <laughs> with Rory <laughs> while he launches his book. Uh, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. I have great honor to have you launching it. And uh, <laughs> big thanks to Francis Black and Colin McInumra and to everybody for staying the course and tuning in and supporting the book and buying the book and sharing all the stuff. And um, listen, let's all stay in touch. Send me your old text messages, your emails, your tweets and all that crack. And uh, lots of love. Big good night to you folks. And uh, I don't know, like, I can't bear wrong us off. Susan. Right, good luck. It's a wrap. Look, I'm disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks.